Right, thank you, Daniel. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, this, is, this uh, talk is a, uh, this afternoon is a guided tour through the MDK. And there's a few, uh, there's a section of the MDK called System Services that covers, uh, covers some things that didn't fit anywhere else. And so I'm going to tell you about those. Uh, and then I'm going to have a, a call to arms about how, how we should develop the, the peer-to-peer uh, future of uh, device drivers. And then I'm going to turn it over to Marty. Uh, so the, the first thing is the, in the system services, there's an out-of-band wake signal uh, that, uh, that is in the platform. And this has to do with how the system powers on. Right? So we're, this is, the idea is this is a truly modular phone. Uh, it is not a phone that has some peripherals added, but, but the whole phone is modular. And so the power button can be on any module. Uh, and, and from an actual dead stop with no power consumption in, in the phone, then the, it has to be able to be powered on with the power button in any module. Um, and also, we want to be able to support multiple modules being able to power up the system. So for example, you could imagine a, an audio module that included a always-on speech coprocessor that wakes the phone on a hot phrase, or you know, features like that we want to be able to support with the platform. Um, and so you see on, the, on this system diagram here, there's the endo uh, in the middle. And then there's these two modules shown. And on the bottom there, in the, the blue arrows, you see there's the, uh, the uh, uh, MFI or LVDS uh, s transporting Unipro that you've heard, you've heard a lot about. Uh, and then there's also, uh, logically, a wake signal. Uh, and the endo can wake a module, or a module can wake the endo. And in a module that has the power button, this wake signal is you know, connected directly to the, like, pressing the power button of the module you know, connects the power and turns this on. Um, now, in the objectives, so the idea is when you press the power button on a module that has a power button, that wakes the endo, and then the endo can then go ahead with waking up the rest of the phone and starting up the system. Um, in the objective system, uh, our plan for this is to use a CW burst on the capacitive data interface, which can then be received by a diode detector, uh, which is zero power, right, on the other side, generating a CMOS level that then can wake the system from a, you know, from a microamp state. Uh, in the prototype, we're using the DC level of the LVDS pairs. There's a, you'll see in the, in, the, in the schematics in the MDK, there's wake lines that go between the modules that allow a module to wake the endo or the endo to wake a module. Uh, module detect is another topic. So how does the system know when a module has been plugged in? Uh, and we, you know, there were some things we've talked about for maybe there should be an optical sensor, maybe there should be a leaf switch or things like that. And we've just tried to be really minimalist on this. And, and uh, so what we've converged on is there's, first of all, no detect when the system is powered down. So if the phone is actually off, uh, it's not able to tell that a module has been inserted. Although you can wake, you can, if, a, if you insert a module that has a power button, you can press the power button and turn it on. So, so there's no sort of startup problem there. Uh, and in the objective, uh, our plan for this is to use M5 link up, uh, you know, which could be from the hibernate state, so it could be while the phone is in sleep, uh, to detect the insertion of a module. Uh, and in the prototype, uh, we're doing this using the DC level of another LVDS pair. Uh, so the same, the same mechanism for wake, but, but here used for detection of insertion of a module. Uh, enumeration, Jurgen talked about this some, so I'm not going to belabor it, but just enumeration is via Unipro DME, and there's a Unipro vendor and product ID uh, that you know, every module developer will get. Uh, and uh, when we have functional drivers, which I'll talk about in a middle, in the, also in the DDB, there's device class specific parameters defining your screen resolution and things like that. Now, of course, there's also nested enumeration for bridge devices, meaning that if you plug in a device that has a Unipro to USB bridge on it, right, then, of course, the operating system is then going to enumerate your USB device uh, after that, uh, or the same with an SDIO device and, and, and so forth. Uh, EPM control is via Unipro DME. Uh, I, Jürgen has completely addressed this, so I'm not going to take any time with it. Um, Okay, so now I want to talk about another topic, which is which is peer-to-peer -peer drivers, peer-to-peer -peer communication. So, the the physical layer and the network layer supports peer-to-peer -peer communication between modules, uh, which is which is exciting and which is different than than uh, uh, USB, for example, which doesn't. Uh, and so, it would be great if if. Uh, 
you know, the ecosystem of, of modules and drivers and, and such develops such that peer-to-peer -peer communication can be utilized in a useful way. And you could imagine peer-to-peer -peer communication between modules is very good for two reasons, right? One, it reduces the power consumption of the system because uh, data does not have to go through the application processor and, and, and consume power there and then come back out. It increases the speed of the system and responsiveness. Uh, and then another thing it does is it fundamentally improves the modularity picture, right? So if you have an application processor that's old and you get yourself a brand new modem and you get yourself a brand new Wi-Fi, right, then you could do tethering, you know, really fast using the fastest new, uh, you know, 6G cell phone uh, network and, uh, you know, uh, wi wi -fi the new Wi-Fi standard not yet developed, right? But if you have your old application processor in there and all the data has to be funneled through there, you know, then, then you can't do that unless you upgrade it. And so the modularity picture is not as good. Um, and so this just chart is just showing all these different use cases for communication peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, tethering, uh, phone call, music player, video recording. The, the, every line on this chart represents some, some useful use of peer-to-peer -peer communication, uh, I suppose, except for the module lines that go to the application processor. Now, the thing about this, though, is that it, it, in practice is tough, right? Because you need, you need a lot of shared functions, which are normally in the SOC, right, to be able to really make use of this. Like you need, for example, format conversion. If I am uh, compression and decompression of audio uh, or video, merging and splitting of network streams. My tethering thing doesn't work if, if uh, you know, the TCP st IP stack only lives in the AP. Video compositing uh, for having a live preview on the camera. Audio mixing. All these shared functions that, you know, sort of more and more are getting put into SOC hardware. Uh, but, you know, there are not standards for how to do these things uh, on, on a network. And so, all of us together here, right, should figure out how to create this peer-to-peer -peer future. It would be great. Now, there's a start out there right now. There's these MIPI standard device-independent protocols uh, that, that are, could be used as the protocols for this, right? right? There's CSI3 for video streaming, DSI2 for display, UFS for flash storage, right? All of these define uh, how to talk to a device without any of the specifics of the register arrangement of the device and that kind of thing uh, mattering. Uh, it's going to be a big project to actually do peer-to-peer -peer layer 5 plus communication, though. So in the near term, uh, we're also supporting host-centric legacy device attached via bridge chips. And uh, you'll hear a lot more tomorrow about, about these bridge chips uh, that, that bridge uh, Unipro to... Uh, USB, SDIO, I2C, I2S, GPIO, that kind of thing. Um, and the layer 5 plus, meaning the layers above Unipro, uh, protocol for communicating with these uh, is uh, RPC to a remote host controller. So, for example, the I2C interface, right, there's a concept of an I2C transfer, and, you know, any I2C interaction can be, can be embodied in this, in this abstraction. Um, and, and there'll be an RPC mechanism so that you can, you know, straight from your app, uh, you know, communicate with your I2C device. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marty, uh, who's going to tell you about software. Thanks, Sarah. Come on. Is this thing on? Okay, good. Hi, my name is Marty Bolivar. I'm here to talk about software. In particular, I'm here to talk about Android. Um, everybody here knows what Aura looks like in terms of its hardware, and that hardware has some implications which imply challenges that we're going to have to overcome in terms of supporting Android on it. So, you know, you can see over here on the left you've got your traditional phone, and on the right you've got your Aura phone, and these are the characteristics that differ which are most important in terms of supporting Android. Um, pretty much they all have to do with, you know, fixed device configurations and lack of hot plug support. Um, there's also this issue that there's a single vendor per phone in a traditional phone, and, you know, they make the system fingerprint. They say, like, this is the Android that runs on this phone and ship it off to Google for certification, whereas here there's this giant ecosystem of vendors that's contributing towards the configuration of any phone at any one time. Um, so we're going to talk about all these issues and how they, how they affect us and how they affect Android support. And we're going to start from the bottom at device drivers and work our way up all the way through the Android platform. Um, before I get there, though, let's talk a little bit about how Android is built today, just to try to keep the talk accessible to people that haven't done any Android platform development work. 
Um, at the bottom of Android, there is a Linux kernel. And so the kernel's primary responsibility is to abstract the hardware that's present on the system and provide higher level interfaces to the rest of the operating system. Uh, and then in addition, and this is something that's not common on other Linux-based systems, which is sort of unique to Android, is that on top of the kernel, there are a set of hardware abstraction libraries, or HALs. And uh, the APIs for these uh, libraries are defined by Google. And usually the vendor will go ahead and fill out those APIs. And the product is provided as a set of shared libraries that are put into the phone and used by the higher levels. And those higher levels are you know, the meat of the Android platform, which are provided by Google. And they take the form of some system services. And so if you're familiar with the traditional Linux, you know, these look a lot like daemons, but they're not called daemons in Android. They're system services. And they are the basis of what is essentially an object-oriented operating system that's running on top of a Linux kernel. So all the way at the top of that are applications, uh, all the apps. They communicate with system services over an interface called Binder. And the system services then proxy you know, what to do to talk to the kernel, usually through a how. Uh, so the how library gets dynamically linked into the process that's running the system server or you know, whatever service in question. Uh, the how will usually issue whatever syscall is necessary to get the kernel to do the hardware, to make the hardware do what it is that we want. OK, so let's move on now that we've all got a bit of context and talk about the requirements that we have developing Aura for our device drivers. Um, one of the main ones, of course, is that we have to support device drivers that have never been written yet, device drivers that we have never conceived, um, that are not part of any existing kernel. Another one that is important, especially on mobile platforms as we know them today, uh, is that our drivers have to work on various different kernel releases and on various different processors. So you know, many of us are familiar with the fact that most phones are based on ARM SOCs. And the ARM architecture you know, pretty much just defines the instruction set and leaves the rest of the hardware you know, peripherals and interfaces that are available on the application processor up to the vendor to provide and to specify. So there's going to be a bunch of different you know, ways to access hardware depending on the chip you're using. And in addition to that, you know, the internal kernel APIs that device drivers use are wildly unstable over time. You know, probably a bunch of us are familiar with stable API nonsense.txt in the kernel's documentation directory. It says, the API is unstable. It, was always, it will always be unstable. There are really good reasons for this, and there are. I'm not trying to say that there aren't. Um, but it does sort of provide a challenge to us in that you know, even the exact same kernel sources, if you compile them with different flags, you're going to end up with structures that have different sizes and alignments. And so a driver that's compiled with the wrong flags isn't going to work on the same kernel sources on the same processor. So that's a challenge. Um, and then these final two requirements are mostly security related. We need to ensure that you know, malicious or misbehaving drivers don't mess up anything else. Don't bring down the system. Don't DOS us, you know, et cetera. So these requirements taken together have led us to conclude that there's pretty much you know, a two-pronged approach, which we're going to take, and that seems to be the viable solution. That's outlined here in our objective device driver slide. So this, as I mentioned, is a two-pronged approach. And on the right-hand side, there is this approach where we've got device class drivers. These are, you know, we've talked about these before. They're going to be based on Unipro. Um, we will provide these drivers for SOC vendors to integrate into the kernels that they release with their AP modules. And the expectation is then that, you know, it's kind of on the SOC vendor to ensure that the, the device class drivers are well integrated and that, you know, supported device classes which work with these drivers are going to be um, functioning properly. Um, so that's you know, in kernel drivers. And since we're providing the class driver and you know, we're checking out the kernel that's given to us by this SOC vendor, there's a reasonable expectation that the result is going to be secure and perform well. On the left-hand side, we've got a uh, user space solution that Paul alluded to earlier. And um, this is what is going to be used to cover cases like uh, modules which use bridge chips, you know, which you know, interface with chips that are not speaking Unipro, like maybe they speak I2C or some other protocol. Um, and so the way that that's going to be supported is that, again, we will provide a driver that is going to be able to communicate with the bridge ASIC on the other side. So this GP bridge ASIC, or general purpose bridge ASIC, is going to live on the module, the non-AP module. 
And its responsibility is going to be to intermediate between the Unipro network and whatever existing protocol like SDIO or s c is in use by the chip that the module vendor is interested in. Um, so somebody has to drive that, and it'll be this driver. And then in order to allow the module vendor to you know, support that chip or the specific functionality of that chip, we're going to you know, provide a set a stable ABI. So people love to fight about what's stable ABI. And we're going to say what we give you is stable. Now, maybe it's going to be a magic device in some octals. Maybe it's going to be a special socket. We haven't nailed down the API yet or the ABI yet. But we're going to say, you know, this is going to give you a stable interface that user land drivers are going to be able to use to issue commands to the host controller on, or the host controllers, I should say, one for each protocol, on the GP bridge ASIC. So that's two-pronged approach. Either way, whenever, whenever a service or a HAL, uh, OK, so sorry, yeah. How does this work in terms of the syscall interface? Well, on the right, you know, it's, it's very traditional. The syscall goes down to the class driver. It talks to the native Unipro module. Result comes back. Everybody's happy. Um, the solution on the left is going to be very familiar to anybody that's familiar with Fuse or the file system in user, user space. And what's going to happen there is that the service, or more likely the HAL, is going to issue a system call, which goes down into the, you know, a device driver will end up need, needing to deal with. That goes down into the driver core, which we've augmented to bounce the result back into the user land driver, which the module vendor has provided. The module vendor driver bounces the result back down into our, through our stable ABI, into the GP bridge ASIC driver, which does the I.O. with the remote side. Result comes back, winds its way down, and up into that S shape, back into the original process that issued the syscall. So, um, that's our device driver story in the objective. Next slide. OK, now what about the rest? What about everything that's on top? Uh, well, the situation can be summed up simply as Android is not modular. Um, it's awesome, and it was designed for today's phones, but that has some implications which are challenges for us on Project Ara. Um, so for example, if you're porting Android to your device, there are a bunch of configuration files that you have to write. You know, you want to support audio on your device. Well, here's you know, some files that you have to write. Say, these are the you know, audio interfaces I support. These are the bit, races, bit rates that they support. By the way, these are the hardware codecs that are baked into my machine. What do you do with those files? You take those files, you stick them into a read-only partition, and you wait for Android to read those files once at boot. Super hot plug, right? Um, similarly, a lot of these HAL APIs, you know, so Google provides these HAL APIs and module vendors, fill, I mean, sorry, hardware vendors fill them out. Um, the shared libraries are also stored in a read only partition. Um, their APIs often preclude hot plug. So, like, it's, you know, there's a giant angry comment in one of the graphics and, or one of the display HALs APIs that says, like, thou shalt not hot plug the primary display, everything will break. Um, sensors assume that the set of sensors on the system is fixed. Um, the list goes on like that. Um, another issue that you might not think of originally is that, well, okay, well, why don't we just like let module developers get into the house and fix this situation up? Um, the reason you can't do that, and that's one of the reasons why we want to segment the user land drivers into their own processes, is that these um, HALs get linked into some fairly privileged processes. You know, almost all of the services on Android live in the giant system server process. And so we can't have, you know, unknown code that hasn't been, you know, metaphorically using Paul's uh, earlier statement, x-rayed by the government to be okay. Um, and additionally, you know, the, the HALs as they exist today end up being pretty tightly coupled to uh, whatever kernel driver you're using to actually support uh, your chip. There are some other issues, uh, like the system fingerprint that I alluded to earlier, that the phone manufacturer ships to Google to say that, like, this is the gold standard Android that I'm about to OTA to all my phones. Is that OK? Includes, at, you know, in the checksum, all of this information, like all these static config files, all these house, all this stuff. Um, so that's no good. And uh, finally, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ARM pretty much just specifies the instruction set leaves the rest of the details to the SOC vendor. And so it hasn't you know, taken the time, it hasn't you know, it's chosen not to, provide us with a mechanism to sort of generically uh, query and enumerate the hardware that's available on an ARM-based system, which is in practice what we're dealing with most of the time. Not always, of course. OK, so what to do? Well, what have software engineers done always? We generalize and we abstract. Uh, we're going to have to take these static configuration files and replace them with a dynamic alternative. 
we're going to make that you know, discoverable through the house, which we will update the APIs so that system services can be notified of the way that you know, the hardware configuration of the phone changes so that they can react appropriately and ensure that apps can do the right thing. Um, we're going to have to take all of that stuff that's currently you know, hardware-related and that is you know, included in the main build image for the phone and stick it into another partition, uh, which we will specify so that when you're making your AP module, you can still get certified without having to know what the phone looks like right now. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the objective modularized Android. OK, uh, to sum up, I want to talk a little bit about how this you know, kind of interacts with the, with the hardware. Uh, and Paul showed this slide earlier, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, but you see on the left, there's you know, Android. There's that Android stack in miniature that we saw earlier. That, of course, runs on the application processor. Uh, and there are two classes of, of drivers. One talks to a class conformant device, which we expect to speak Unipro natively. And the other one is a legacy or non-class conformant device, uh, which doesn't. And you can see that uh, the AP is going to talk through the bridge ASIC. Uh, I guess this, a lot of this has been covered already. When I made my slides, I didn't know. So I won't spend too much time on this, since we're running low on time, and I don't want to bore you. Um, but yeah, that's how it all fits together. Hardware, software. And that's what we want. What do we have today uh, to get going? As Jurgen said, we kind of made this prototype uh, under the idea that we should try to leave as many device drivers, et cetera, unmodified as possible to get off the ground quickly and to enable you to get off the ground quickly, solving a lot of the electrical and mechanical and you know, other firmware problems that you're going to run into as you know, ASIC development and all this driver development can proceed in parallel. So we've got some hardware. We've got some development hardware. We've got a development switch. We've got a development AP board. And we've got a generic kind of endpoint board that breaks out all those native protocols that we can talk to today and intermediates that to the Unipro network. There is a, a talk, a development hardware software talk tomorrow, and uh, there will be a panel. I'll be on it. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about it. Um, and in addition, uh, to support the AP board that we have, we've got, as has been mentioned, we forked a Linara release of Android, uh, and we added a little bit of you know, extra prototyping sauce to kind of make it easier to get off the ground and some cases. I think earlier there was a question about like, could I make you know a module? Could I make a thermal imager or a pulse oximeter in a day? Um, we did, as I recall, write the pulse oximeter app in like a week, right? And that was made possible because we added a bit of extra special sauce to access you know system buses like I2C uh, and GPIOs from apps, so that you don't have to worry about writing your own device drivers if you're dealing with kind of simple cases like this. And all that code is going to get open sourced. And so watch the Project Aura website, and we'll announce the release when it's ready. So that's what I got. Thanks very much. All right. Welcome, Aura. Come on up. We've got a couple of quick questions for you guys. Um, Dieter Rams, again, asks, will the information be unicast or multicast? for multiple modules that need the same information? So I believe, as Jurgen mentioned earlier, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, the Unipro network as it stands does not support broadcast. So you'll need separate connections to each module. All right, easy. Smadger asks, is there a way to isolate a module from communicating peer-to-peer -peer with another module but still keep its functionality? Yes, that is largely the job of the supervisory controller, uh, which controls the routing table on the network. Awesome. Those are the two questions we've got. How about Great. from the room? Anybody got questions on the software side? I'll bet there's a bunch of folks that are trying to think about how to make, make this, uh, their modules work in this, in this environment. Got a question over here? Yeah. Just a quick question on implementing, uh, implementing drivers uh, via the user space right. uh, API for high data rate applications. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious whether you have any idea of whether the scheduler C groups or CPU set C groups are likely to be able to achieve good real time bounds. Uh, right. At so, present. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, of course, when you're dealing with any user space drivers, there are a lot of issues. All the extra context switching can imply extra latency. You know, there's uh, 
a lot of concerns that are mostly performance related with that sort of architecture. Um, I think that we're going to have to bite the bullet and just try to cover the really important cases with class drivers. And then l maybe there will be more of a performance hit for these sort of special purpose cases. Um, of course, as you mentioned, there are a lot of knobs you can tweak in your system to try to control the priority of you know, various access to different resources. Uh, Yeah, I think, to my knowledge, that there are still some open questions in that regard. And so I, I would say that you know, my answer to that for high performance cases is like try to fit within a device class. And it'll be incumbent upon us to provide satisfactory device classes to cover those cases. But that's, but that's good feedback, too. But uh, it's good feedback. Yeah. All right, we've got another couple of questions here. Go ahead. Also, I also have questions about your idea uh, to put drivers to the user land, user space. Right. Uh, just I'm wondering, did you guys already make some research and you confident that it's possible? Because there's like many reasons why drivers typically reside in the kernel. Sure. And I'm just wondering, let's say, video driver or Wi-Fi driver. Uh, it's you, a what kind of driver? Sorry. Video controller driver or Wi-Fi driver. They're always part of the kernel. My sure. question is. For example, for your prototype device, if you already port a driver to the user space and you are happy with functionality and performance? No, I think that Fuse is the main existence proof that this sort of approach is feasible in general. Um, whether or not it's going to be performant um, in every case, I think, is going to vary, vary a lot by case. Um, and so we are going to have to punt a bunch of stuff into you know, device classes for, as you say, uh, Cases like video or other high throughput applications, and I think you know there are a fair amount. There's a fair amount, you know, for throughput, you can do a lot in user space if you're not so concerned with latency. Um. I think also it's important to point out that, for example, for a uh, a video device or a, a network uh, a network device, uh, you know, would would almost certainly be served either through a class driver or through uh, the the. Unipro to USB bridge or Unipro to SDIO bridge, um, that uh, it's right. probably unlikely that someone would build a network device uh, with a special purpose uh, Unipro interface that was not conformant to the class driver. Um, either it would be an existing uh, networking chip that connected through a, the bridge, and in that case it does go right through the kernel and there's no user space driver, or it would be a, if it was a, you know, Unipro uh, M5 Wi-Fi chip, right? Then, you know, hopefully it would be conformant to the, you know, uh, not yet existing MIPI spec for those, right? And then, uh, and then, and then could use the class driver. So it's sort of only the case of devices that that are not in a sort of not not in a defined class uh, are not using an ex a bridge, right? But also need so low latency that this is an issue, which actually we're interested in, in sort of soliciting what those use cases are. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been trying to think of a use case like that, and honestly, we haven't been able to think of one. Um, but if, uh, if the group of us all here can think of some use cases in that area, uh, you know, we'd like to know. OK, and another question right here. Sh sure, can you, can you talk a little bit about how the uh, drivers will get provisioned when a user buys a module? Yes. Uh, so we expect that, OK, there's a bit of a um, bootstrapping problem in the case of uh, modules that provide network services. Um, but in other cases, we think that there will be a, a mechanism very similar to the way that the Play Store works now, where you know, when you install your app, there's a set uh, of uh, supporting server infrastructure that lets you get you know, any drivers or any additional, you know, module-related software configuration um, that's going to go along to support it, yeah. We have a couple other questions that were earlier, uh, maybe more directed towards uh, Jurgen, but I'm just going to ask them because we're one team, and you guys might be able to, to uh, get into these. So MBG asked earlier, is it, if it's possible to set up an assured pipeline between two modules? 
So the scenario they give is, for example, someone develops a VPN module for connecting their VPN concentrator, and you can assure that all traffic from Android goes through that module before going to Wi-Fi or to 4G. Is that something that you guys have any thoughts on? It's certainly possible if you trust the switch, if you trust the supervisory controller. Yeah, that, 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 that is supported by the network architecture. Yeah. Do you trust the switch? I trust the switch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, let me ask another question that maybe Jurgen will jump in on here. So is there a way, and, and the user names here is Andrew Ara Crew, David Ara Team, Jason Ara Team. Is there a way to remotely access data from DRAM of one EP to DRAM of another EP, like RDMA? Uh, I think we're not expecting that, that uh, the RAM, uh, RAM would be in a separate module from the processor that was accessing it, just because the, the, the latency of the network is, is low. It's a few microseconds, but you know, it's not in the sort of you know, tens of nanoseconds range that you would want for that, for that use case. Um, I think certainly if you have information on one module that another module wants to get, of course, of course you can, I mean, of course you can transmit it. But in terms of having shared memory between processors on different modules, I think we're not, we're not expecting that the platform is going to be uh, you know, really capable of that. That's kind of an architectural consequence of Unipro not being a memory mapped uh, communication interface. Okay, and we have a question over here. Yeah, um, we're seeing Android running on a myriad of devices nowadays, on cars, fridges, everything. Um, it sounds like Project R is a, an attempt in part to make Android run on a lot more things a lot more easily. Would you guys be able to comment on what Aura might mean for the Android ecosystem outside of Project Aura? Uh, so we're, we're pretty excited uh, just personally, I think, I, I'm personally excited personally about the idea of, uh, you know, being able to do a project, right, taking a, starting with, starting with one of these phones and making a custom module that, you know, makes it the controller for some other, uh, some other device. I think that'll enable all kinds of sort of small volume, uh, you know, cool stuff to get built um, and, you know, might make it get built with an Android, uh, you know, Android-based UI. Uh, so. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, almost thinking figuratively a little bit, if you can get Android to run between all these blocks, uh, perhaps you can get Android to run on blocks that aren't part of the RF phone um, wirelessly to other devices and such, if, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, it's a natural scenario. It's one that kind of Paul had addressed earlier today that while those things get us excited too, that we're really focused on making a great phone. And you can see that there's other efforts across Google, such as Android Wear, to really think about tailored scenarios where we want to make sure that hardware and software work well together. So we get excited about those, but we're not making any promises or any kind of commitments to really focus outside of that core scenario for now. Cool. Okay, we got another question over here. Go ahead. So uh, have you guys thought of a scenario where uh, one sensor is used by multiple apps and like there could be some issues of like they sharing data between multiple apps by for, for one sensor only so that is like a sensor for like measuring sugar from the blood samples and uh, there are a couple apps trying to use the same sensor so maybe there is like conflict maybe not somebody wants to like proprietary lock their sensors only for the apps so is there any like concerns or something Let's see so locking to a particular module vendor app is not something i had personally considered um, I think that to answer your more general question about like contention between apps, I mean you could think about like audio being a shared resource yeah. that's presently, you know, different apps are going to contend for it. You know, maybe you get a phone call while you're listening to you know music, um, and it seems like this is kind of a solved problem. The system services are always intermediating between apps and hardware, and so they can control access and arbitrate. Much in this case of sensors, there's the sensor API, right? That's yeah, and exactly. For to, to to address your question specifically, yeah, there's like a sensor service which distributes sensor events, you know, to any set of interested apps. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. 